Welcome back to uh, MIT 12.S191, Intro to Computational Thinking. This is Lecture 4 of the Climate Modeling, modeling Unit. Um, and once again, I'm Henri Drake. I'm a PhD student in Climate Science and Oceanography at MIT. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about solving partial differential equations, or PDEs, numerically. So we've done uh, the one-dimensional case in the last lecture on Tuesday, and we saw a few different perspectives on it. Um, what does it mean to go from continuous to discrete? Um, how do you implement these kinds of algorithms, etc.? And today we're going to build on that by adding a second dimension, and we'll see that um, things already get a lot more interesting when you add in a second dimension. And just to give a sense of what we're building towards, um, here's a uh, very state-of-the-art, complicated climate model uh, simulation where you're looking at temperatures off the coast of the United States. And you can see the orange, dark orange colors here are very warm. So this is warm water coming up from Florida up the coast of the U.S. And that's what keeps uh, the eastern coast of the U.S. relatively warm given its latitude. Um, and you can see that off the coast of, uh, of Canada here, you actually have some cold waters coming down. And so there's actually these two counter-rotating gyres, one going like this, and one going like this. Um, and so that's sort of the, the problem we're going to model today. All right, so just to give a little bit of background, um, what do I mean by two-dimensional advection diffusion? So uh, recall from uh, the last lecture that one-dimensional advection diffusion is a partial differential equation that looks like this. So you have uh, a temperature which has a function of, is a function of both time, t, and space, in this case x. Um, and what we want to know is how does, given you know, a single location, x, how does that temperature change in time? So the partial derivative of temperature with respect to time. And that's going to be equal to the sum of two effects. One is advection. Uh, so this u dt dx, which is basically how does temperature get moved around, or how does heat get moved around by a current. And in this case, it's just a constant current either going to the right at a certain speed or to the left at a certain speed. But on top of that, you have this effect of diffusion. And what diffusion does, instead of just moving things from one side to another, it acts to spread heat out. And so this is why, um, you know, if you... Um, have air conditioner, you know, at one side of your room, um, eventually that, that cold air is going to sort of get to the other side of the room. That acts through diffusion. Um, all right, so what we want to do now is extend this equation, this temperature equation, to two dimensions. Um, so to do that, we have this equation, where what we've done is now we have temperature not just as a function of one single spatial dimension x, but a second spatial dimension y. Um, and today we're going to sort of think of x as being east, uh, west to east, um, so that's a longitudinal direction, so going sort of around the world this way, and then we'll think of y as um, the meridional direction or south to north, um, so going around the earth this way. And so the advection term, we now get two of them, so we have one is moving water, uh, water moving from say um, east to west, so that's a u. And then um, we also have a north-south velocity, v. Um, and both of these now can be a function of x and y. So the currents are not just always going to be going at the same speed. They could have some variations, um, so some localized currents. And then the diffusion is still going to be a constant parameter, uh, diffusivity kappa. Um, and that's uh, going to have a second term now, where you have the second derivative with respect to y. So we have diffusion both things spreading out both in X and also in Y. And we'll, we'll look at some movies of, of how that actually works out in practice. Okay. Um, so you can think of the velocities here, U and V, um, either as separately sort of one moving um, east to west, so this way, and then one moving in this way, or you can think about it as a vector field. Um, so this vector, uh, U with the vector sign, um, has both an X uh, direction, x component, and a y component. Okay, so what we want to do is discretize this equation so that we can implement it on a computer. 
Um, so just to review how we did this in one dimension, um, we have our temperature, and now instead of looking at all any x, um, so any location x and any time t, we actually have to pick a grid. So um, you know we're going to have an ith uh, x grid cell and an nth time step. Um, and so if we want to find the gradient with respect to the dimension x, um, the spatial dimension x, we basically do this centered finite difference where you take um, basically the difference in temperature over two grid cells. So you take the one, the temperature to the right and the temperature to the left. You take their difference and you divide by the distance between them. And that gives you a, a sort of approximation of the gradient um, in that direction or the derivative. So in, and so um, in two dimensions, we do the exact same thing, except now instead of just looking at a grid in x, so this x subscript i, we also have a second dimension y, and we're going to discretize that as well, um, and so you can look at grid cell j. Um, and so the difference is still, you're still going to fix that j, but you're now going to do the difference, um, you know, uh, on both sides, so the one to the right of it and the one to the left of it. So this is um, sort of the equation way of thinking about it, but you can also think about it as sort of a, a kernel, right? So um, the way to read this kernel is that uh, the red color is a one, the blue is a minus one, and the gray is a zero. Um, you can see that here as an offset array. And so um, if you basically take the temperature array and you multiply it by this kernel, you're going to get one times the temperature to the right, so this red one, that's this term, um, zero times the temperature in the current cell, and then minus one times the temperature to the left, so that's this one. So this is sort of an equivalent way of thinking about this gradient operator. Uh, and if you remember from way early in the class when we did image processing, this kernel actually looks a lot like edge detection or sharpening kernels that are used in image processing and, and also in machine learning. Um, and the reason is that the gradient is basically sort of how fast are things changing. Um, and so that could sort of detect an edge in an image. So that was in the x direction. We also have these partial um, derivatives in the y direction, so for that typo. Um, and that's the same thing, except now this kernel is going to be vertical. Um, and so we can just add these two together. And now we can approximate these whole first advection terms. Um, so this is now movement by the currents of heat um, as these two terms. So the velocities just uh, evaluated at their own grid cells and then these kernels for the gradients. So we're going to implement this using uh, Julia functions down here. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to use uh, this nice aspect of Julia, which is multiple dispatch. So the idea is that we can use multiple methods for the same overlying function with the same name. So the first one we do is just to calculate this term for a given i and j. And so what that looks like is, um, so this actually has a minus in front of it, but we do minus, so u at i and j times this whole kernel, which you can write as the sum of the kernel times the temperature um, basically in that neighborhood. So just those three temperatures that we can use um, to match this, the size of this kernel. And then divide by um, the, the spatial derivative, or the, the grid cell spacing. Um, and then we do the second one as well. So it's the same thing, but now with the v, or the um, north, south, up, down derivative. So that uh, is for a given i and j. But what we want to do is actually get a whole array of these tendencies. Um, so we have the second method, which now it doesn't have the i and j because it's actually going to loop over those, right? So we're basically just calling this method at a whole bunch of different i and j's. Um, and this starts at the second index and only goes to the second to last for reasons we'll get to uh, a little bit later. But so this is now going to give us a whole array of these, uh, these floating points, which are our tendencies. Um, and so then we have a final method, which just um, is basically shorthand that uses this ocean model type, which we'll introduce later, um, just as an easier way so you don't have to give each one of these arguments every time. Okay, 
So that was the advection term. So those were our first two terms of the equation. And now we have the second two terms. Um, so how do we do those? So we saw in the one dimensional case that um, it's very similar to advection, except since it's a second derivative, um, it actually looks like this. And so you can think about this as these kinds of kernels where blue is now negative two and these red are one. And so what you're doing is you're subtracting your own value and giving it to your neighbors. So that's sort of spreading things out. So if you have a lot of heat, you're going to lower your own heat and give it to your neighbors. Um, and this is also sort of similar to uh, blurring uh, type of uh, kernels in, in image processing. Um, okay, and so, right, so we do the, the same exact type of, of uh, operations with these kernels and we're going to implement it uh, just like we did above for advection. Um, so again, we take our constant kappa times these kernels acting on the temperature in this neighborhood, um, sum that up to get the full effect of the kernel, and then divide by, uh, in this case, the second uh, derivative uh, infinitesimal spacing. Um, and then the same thing in the y direction. And then we just have to return uh, we use a second method to give an array um, where we again loop over all of the different indices in the array. And then finally we have this sort of convenience method which just calls uh, the ocean model. Okay, so that's actually, if we go up here, that's all of these terms in the equation we've now written. Um, so now all that's left is the time stepping. Except for one fact, we haven't dealt with what to do with the boundaries. So we've got this grid from i to j, um, or you know i and j from, from 1 to n, but we haven't talked about what to do at this first value i and the last one n. So what we're going to do in this case um, is one of the examples we saw in, in the previous lectures is the no flux boundary conditions. Uh, these are also called Neumann boundary conditions. Um, but what this basically means is that we want the advection term to be zero at the wall. So think about this as our domain is sort of the Atlantic Ocean, and we want the Atlantic Ocean to end when you hit land. So when you hit you know, the east coast of the US, you don't want the ocean current to go pointing into the land. That doesn't make any sense. So by definition, we want these fluxes to be zero here. We don't want the ocean to you know, flux heat into the land. Um, and the same thing for this diffusive flux here. Um, so this is for the x direction, but then also when you hit, you know, Greenland in the north, um, we also want to have that boundary condition in y, uh, so in that direction. And so um, to impose this, we basically are going to add an extra cell all the way around our whole two-dimensional array, and we're going to treat those as ghost cells. Um, and what I mean by that is that they actually don't do anything. So if you'll remember from these kernels here, we never actually computed these terms for, for i equals 1 or j equals 1 or um, you know, i equals n, uh, the size of the array. Um, so those are ghost cells. They don't actually ever do anything except help us to enforce these boundary conditions. And the way that works is if we just give the example of um, the fluxes between i equals 1 and i equals 2, so these are sort of the fluxes into the east coast of the US, um, we want to discretize this, these derivatives up here. Um, and one way to enforce that is just enforcing that the derivative dt dx is equal to 0. So if we write that in the discretized form, it's just that um, this, uh, so the difference between the second grid cell and the first grid cell um, divided by their separation is equal to zero. Um, since delta x is, is positive, non-zero, we can multiply by that, and then we basically can just have the fact that these two have to have the exact same value. And the trick here is that the i equals two, this second one, this is actually a real cell, whereas this one is a ghost cell. And the ghost cells, we haven't done anything with them yet, so we can tune their value to whatever we want, so that we can force these boundary conditions to be valid. And so what we do is we have this function called update ghost cells, where we just literally set uh, the j equals one and the i equal one values 
to uh, i equals 2 and j equals 2. And we do the same thing on the other end, so the last value is equal to the second to last, last value equal to the second to last. And that enforces these no flux conditions. So if you're still a little confused as to what that's doing, let's, let's look at an example. So here I just calculate um, a random 6 by 6 matrix of floating points between 0 and 1 um, and visualize it as a heat map. And so we've got these ghost cells are these ones on the outer rim of this array. And so what we want to do is to make the flux go to 0, we want to set their value to the one right inside of it. So this one would be set to here, this one set to here, etc. And so indeed, if we look down here, we take an exact copy of this array, but we update the ghost cells. So all we're doing is we're changing these outer values, and you can see indeed that we sort of set all of the outer values to the one right inside of it. And that's going to set all of these fluxes to zero for us. Okay, so that handles everything except for the time stepping. Um, and this I'm not going to spend too much time on because it's the exact same formula we used in basically every other lecture of the climate model uh, unit. So all it does is um, it takes our uh, data type for the simulation. I'll talk about that later, but it's basically all the variables we've seen so far. It updates uh, the ghost cells. It calculates the tendencies. So you sum both the advective tendency from the currents and the diffusive tendency of sort of diffusing heat around. Um, and then all you do is you update the temperature. Um, and remember, we're only updating the interior temperature, so we don't touch the ghost cells here. Um, so that's why it starts at, at 2 and ends at n minus 1. Um, and so we update the temperature by just taking the tendencies that we calculated up here and multiplying them by delta t, our time step. Um, and here we're just going to sort of keep track of how much time is passing with this uh, iter, so iteration number. Uh, just increment that up one every time we do the time step. Okay, um, so now I'm going to talk about the data structures we're using here. Um, so the first thing is this struct. So this is now an immutable struct, so we can't change these values um, just sort of anytime we want. Um, and that's because this is our spatial grid. It's going to be fixed. For any given simulation, this is going to stay fixed. And so um, We've got our number of grid points, the size or the length L of our uh, domain, the grid spacings in both dimensions, the actual dimensions themselves, X and Y, um, and then the number of grid points in each dimension. Um, and they're going to be slightly different for um, X and Y. And so uh, in actuality, all we need to define all of these parameters is just the number of grid points in the x dimension um, and the length in that dimension. And then um, all these other ones we can calculate from those. So um, since we have n endpoints over a length L, we can get the grid spacing by just dividing the length by the number of grid points and et cetera for these other things. So that handles our numerical grid. Um, and then we have our parameters. So the only free parameter here really is this diffusivity kappa um, that just sets sort of how quickly is heat going to get uh, diffused around the simulation. And then we have um, an abstract type. And the reason we do this is because uh, we don't want to a priori tell you what kind of climate model you're, you have to build. So in this case, we're going to look at an ocean only climate model. But actually in the last homework of the course, you're going to build a coupled atmosphere ocean climate model. And so you'll actually be defining your own subtype of this climate model type. Um, so the subtype that we're doing here is an ocean model. So it's a subtype of the climate model. And all it's got is its grid, the parameters, which we saw above, and then these two velocity vectors that define the velocity field. So this is going to tell us basically where are the currents and, and how fast are they. Um, and then we just have these sort of two convenience methods uh, for constructing instances of those uh, that subtype. And finally, um, we have this sort of master structure, which is our uh, climate model simulation. So if you want to actually run an instance of the climate model, uh, you do it with this climate model simulation. So it's got all the climate model parameters here. Um, remember, this is the abstract type. Um, so the ocean model is a subset of those. 
Um, and then our state variables. So we have um, the time, that's our sort of main state variable that we're time stepping forward. Um, the time step, which determines how often uh, you want to take a time step. And then just the iteration number uh, to keep track of the passage of time. All right. And so that is um, basically all of the functions and data structures we need for our model. So now let's look at it in action. So um, here we're going we're gonna to start, uh, basically instantiate all of our different model components. So for our grid, we're going to start with just 16 data points in X. Um, and then in Y, we're going to have twice as many. So it's going to be 32 in Y. And then the length of our ocean, um, let's just say it's uh, 6 times 10 to the 6 meters, which is 6,000 kilometers. Turns out that's roughly the width of an ocean, like the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so that's a pretty good size for us. So for the parameters, uh, we're, it just has one parameter. It's this uh, diffusivity kappa, and we're going to let that vary. Um, I give it a default value here. Um, and then we have our velocity field. We're going to start with just zeros, so we don't have any velocities. There's no currents, just sort of a, a, sit, a flat, you know, sitting ocean with just diffusion, no advection, no currents. Um, okay, and then we're um, going to start with this initial condition. So this is our initial T that we start the model off. Um, and this is just going to have a whole ocean with a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius, and then one patch in the middle with a temperature of 1. Um, so this is basically the two-dimensional analog of the um, of the box we did in one-dimensional infection with Professor David Sanders. Um, okay, so that's the initial condition. And then uh, our ocean model just takes sort of all of these parameters in. And then our time step is going to be, um, so this is six hours, right? So this is 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour, and six hours. And that defines our simulation. So let's, let's check it out. So here we're just plotting our 2D array of temperatures. Uh, with the initial condition we started here, this init box. And um, we don't have any velocity field here, so I turn the velocity on and it doesn't do anything. Um, and so all that's going to happen here is diffusion. Um, so let me reinitialize it. Okay, so let's start it. So this is now going to go, and you can see that the days tick by up here. So that's 38 days. It's starting to spread out a bit, this box. It's spreading out even more. And it's sort of spreading out circularly here, right? Um, and so it turns out this is basically spreading out as kind of a 2D Gaussian. Um, and I'm not going to run it forever, but eventually, basically, it's just going to spread to fill the whole domain. And the whole ocean is going to have the same temperature. That's sort of what diffusion does at very long times, uh, if you don't have any interesting boundary conditions or anything. OK, so let's stop that one. Um, we can make it, you know, we can do the same thing, but with a smaller grid. So let's do that. Okay, so now our box is a little bigger just because there's less grid cells. And we can watch that one spread as well. And the temperature is decreasing in the center and increasing on the other sides. So one way of thinking about this is instead of showing the absolute temperature, Let's look at the anomalies. So what is the change in temperature relative to the initial condition? And so here we see it like that. So blue values are negative. So this is this initial box we had is actually getting colder, and it's losing its heat to the outside. It's diffusing it to everywhere else in that ocean. OK, so that's sort of our least interesting case. Um, let's look at something a little more interesting. So what if we have this? So this is our second example where we're getting our velocity fields from this point vortex. Um, and we're going to use a still a box as our initial condition. But now our box is going to look like this. All right, so we're starting with a box that spans all the way across the ocean now. Um, and we've got an interesting velocity field, which looks like I'll show up in a second. It looks like this. So we've got this vortex, which is spinning um, in this direction, cyclonically. And um, what we expect is that 
the temperatures here are going to go this way, so it's going to move heat upwards here, and these velocities, since they're going downwards, it's going to move the velocities here. So let's see if that's what happened. What, what happens? Yeah, so indeed, right after a few hundred days, we see that these temperatures are going up over here, and these temperatures are going down over here. And if we look at the absolute values instead of just the, or if we look at the anomalies instead of the absolute values, we can see that more clearly. So it's getting warmer up here where the currents are to the north, and um, it's getting warmer down here. Okay, so that's just sort of, um, that's not like a realistic ocean circulation. This is just sort of an idealized vortex. Um, it turns out it's actually pretty similar to what the velocities in a hurricane would look like if a hurricane was in the ocean, <laughs> so 100 times slower or so. Um, but we can also start out with something that's actually more realistic for the ocean. Um, so that's what this looks like. So we've got, um, think about this as being the equator down here and the North Pole up here. So the North uh, Pole is much colder. So um, these temperatures are, are sort of wrong, but think about this as very cold and this very warm. Um, and now we're going to turn on the currents um, and those look like this. So we've got currents, just like we saw at the beginning in that video, we have the Gulf Stream coming up the coast of the, the US and then it detaches from the coast and goes towards Europe. And down here we've got uh, Arctic water coming down, it's really cold. Um, it's coming down towards uh, the eastern US and then going out into the, into the Atlantic. And so when we start the simulation, what's going to happen is that these currents that go north on the western boundary, they're going to bring this warm equatorial water up. So you can already see that happening a little bit. And it's bringing cold water down here. And so um, that's sort of what happens. And we can look at the anomalies, because uh, then maybe they'll show up a little better. So to get these anomalies, you just take the instantaneous temperature at that time, and then subtract out the initial temperature um, of the ocean. And so indeed, you can see you know, kind of weakly here that there's uh, warming in this western boundary region and, cool and cooling above here. So this is bringing warm water from the equator, warming up the eastern coast of the US, and this is bringing cold water from above and cooling um, the east coast of Canada. So um, this is a really simple setup, um, but for homework, what you're going to do is basically um, add in atmospheric effects. So um, in particular, in this ocean right now, all we have is moving around um, ocean currents, advecting heat around, and then also diffusion, which is going to diffuse things around. Um, but if we ran this forever, so we've only run it for a few years here, but if we ran it for, say, 100 years, the whole ocean would just have the exact same temperature because diffusion would just sort of make everything uniform. So what you're going to do for homework is add in the fact that, well, actually, the equator gets more sun than the North Pole. So you're going to get a lot more heating down here and uh, less heating up here. And on top of that, when the ocean warms up, it's going to emit radiation to space. Uh, so for the homework, you're basically going to take the functions we used for the zero dimensional climate model early on in the course, and you're gonna apply them to this ocean. All right. Um, let's try one last example, and um, that's pretty much all I had for today. So um, if people have questions, I'll, I'll answer them in the chat. And yeah, thanks everyone. Let's see if we can crank up the resolution a little bit here. I'm sorry that it's not running that quickly. It ran way faster when I was not streaming. So <laughs> I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I guess the stream is taking up a lot of my CPU or something. Okay, so here we can go. It's starting to, to move forward.
And uh, as usual, we'll post the notebook um, online so people can run it on their own computers and it'll probably run like 100 times faster from my experience <laughs> when you're not streaming. All right. Thanks everyone, I'm gonna probably stop the stream now. <laughs>